Are you anxious to hear talk to Ben Gigi tonight? Okay. Here's how we're going to do this. Were you blessed on Saturday with a lot of the things you had to share? Okay. After I have a word of prayer, uh, Danny will come up, and then right around after about an hour, we'll take about a 10 to 15 minute break. Uh, and then he'll come back and he'll teach some more. So uh, gracious God and uh, our Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the people that are here tonight, Father, that, uh, that we have a, a people, an assembly of people who love your Torah, who love your people. And Father, that uh, they have a desire to do the right thing, to walk in righteousness, to be sanctified by your commandments, to know you like they've never known you before. And one way to do that, Father, is to know your words, your language, uh, and as we do, we'll become closer to your heart. Bless Dr. Ben Gigi as he shares tonight and all those who have open hearts and open ears. Amen. Dr. Ben Gigi. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to jump right straight to Hebrew. You have the book in front of you. <clears throat> So I'm not going to, it was a big issue of how we're going to stretch everything in the framework of the time I'm left here. And as much as I try to shrink everything I do, it just simply cannot happen. What I'll do, I'll make myself available beyond this class with my telephone number. It will be at the office. And people can call me every evening, every day. Don't worry about the time. Study with the book. No, no, I'm going to do a tutorial with people, even privately, over the phone. It's that we need to do that because I, I will not be able to do everything here. But I still want to work with people. I want to encourage you. The importance of Hebrew is beyond any words I can say here. And that was good that we spoke yesterday with you, Maureen, and your husband, and uh, with the, the voice family. Why really the Hebrew? What, what difference it makes? And we spoke with Sue much about the subject. And Sue raised an issue that I knew it. I called it DNA. Sue called it the heart. She believes, and I, I accepted it immediately, there is something in our heart, in our DNA, that knows the truth. We do know, and there is a reason for each one of you to be here, not here with me, but here, here, be here generally with uh, Pastor Mark Bills and Pastor Art and, and the other people here that uh, take care of this uh, community and congregation to work properly. And the reason is beyond a coincidence, beyond a coincidental level. The reason is simply, I think, the fire that did not put down throughout the generation is keep on burning in the heart of each one of you. But it's in the heart, not in the brain, as Sue was kind of pointing it to me yesterday. Where is Sue? Is she here someplace? She was pointing it yesterday. It's not in the heart. It's not in the brain. It is in the heart. And the brain has some kind of filtering process. But Sue was saying that the heart then has a thinking power. And I believe that because the Hebrew Bible speaks about tvunat halev, the wisdom of the heart. There is then the wisdom of the heart. And our understanding on the continuum of time, because you have grandparents and they had grandparents, and somewhere along the line, you're stopped, and someone inside you in that little DNA says, now you break out of your circle. And people come from churches. I hear that people come from Catholic churches and other churches and even from occults. And they stop at some moment in time and they say, now I want to do this. I want to know what is the Hebrew heart behind, beyond our teaching. But Pastor Art was saying something yesterday to me that really kind of shook me a little bit. He said, well, not everything is there. And my dear friend Frank Sigan says this too, and I need to use the Greek a lot. So I decided to go around the, that line of uh, resorting just to the Greek. And I'm going to prove tonight that one of the most magnific magnificent and strong and powerful teachings of the entire time that is really the bond that holds all the people together and all our knowledge and our faith together can be proved in Hebrew and taught in Hebrew from the New Testament, and it's not in the Old. We did talk part of that, Frank, on the way. I didn't completely complete that story with you. <clears throat> but it really shows in the, in the Old Testament. Now, there is a handout I gave out. I just need one copy of that handout. 
if we can... Tina made the copies. Oh, you can give me one. Thank you so much. And it's in color and it's good. Okay. Uh, we're talking about the, <clears throat> the alphabet. There are 22 letters. And as I understand, some of them already knew it. Some, how many people don't know anything about the Hebrew alphabet or can say, I don't know the alphabet? Okay, so there's quite a few hands here. We do have quite a few. Um, that's about 30%, 20%. Okay. Well, if I, if I spend too much time on that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bore the other group. That's always the dilemma. What do we do? So let's go over quickly of the letters of the alphabet, quickly over the letters. <clears throat> and then uh, one of the expectations I have here today, that each one of you will be able to read, to write in Hebrew in at least a proficiency of 50% within less than 30 minutes. In a profi proficiency of 50%. And the reason for that is because Hebrew is very phonetic. What you hear is what you write. Unlike English, when you hear the word brochure, who knows how to, I, you know, I, I, I taught in college for 10 years, ask me how to spell bureaucracy, I have to whisper to somebody, how do you spell that? I don't know how to spell that. You know? So there are some words that are still struggling, I have to think of the letters. It doesn't really happen in Hebrew, it's pretty phonetic. 22 Hebrew characters, each one of them is alive, is a living entity. Each one of them has a deep meaning. The aspect of the deep meaning beyond the pictures that stand below the letters is the area of Frank Sickens. We're not going to do that tonight. You've done it here, and probably Frank will teach more of that in the future. But I'm going to stay with the letters themselves. We have the Aleph, the first one, and then the Bet and the Vet. They are the same exact letters, Bet and Vet except for to make the sound of ba in Hebrew, we put a dot inside the bet. And it's the same letter. Why do we have two? Well, that's, the next one is a gimel, and that's the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Then the dalet, and then the hey. Let's say together one time, from one to five, from aleph to hey. Let's say aleph, bet, gimel, dalet, and then hey. You know, okay, once again, aleph, bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. Another, actually, out of the 22 Hebrew letters, you already know half, exactly half, just by knowing English. Same letters, diff slightly different names, same sounds. So, Aleph, Bet is the A, B, you know. Then Gimel, it's not in the right order. And then the D is the fourth letter of the English alphabet, and it's Dalet. So, instead of saying D, you say Dalet. And then comes the Hey. Let's say it together again. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. And then comes Vav. Franks love this letter. This is a nail, connects you to a lot of things. Vav, Zain, Chet, and Tet. Again, Vav, Zain, Chet, Tet, and the letter Yud. Now remember, five, the letter five, He, is also a standalone name of God. When you put the letter He, it can stand for the name of God. And so is the letter Yud, the tenth. Not coincidentally, the letter Yud, the tenth letter, tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, is also stands for the name of God. So the He is the name of God on its own, and so is the Yud. So don't need to do overzealously the letter Chet, because it may sound like I was introduced once to an engineer that came from Israel in some place in Arizona, and people say, oh, you know, there's somebody from Israel, you want to talk to him? I said, Sure, why not? It's a countryman. So we stood for two minutes and had a conversation. I said to him, where are you from? And what's your name? And nice to meet you. Sounded like a very small talk between two people. And I see a guy there. He was the computer guy. He, Kenny, you looked appalled. I said, what's wrong? He said, well, it sounded like you're sta standing here and attempting to spit at one another. <laughs> and that was because of the chet, you know. So we say, uh, we don't need to go overzealous with this letter because it's, you know, between that and what it is, you can say, chet, it's okay. It's not the het. It's not he. It's chet. And it's ugly as enough it sounds. The, ne the meaning of that word in Hebrew also means a sin. You know, chet is a sin in Hebrew. But it's spelled differently. But that's the same thing. <clears throat> so let's go from the top to the, to the middle. Aleph, bet, gimel, dalet, hey. Once again, aleph, bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. Well, I can see some people here shy away from saying it, but, you know, the commitment is emitting the words. You're more committed when you say it. 
So for everybody, let's say it again together. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. I see one person there in the you know, 15th, 16th row. That person is doing it. I know that you're not announcing. Please say it. You know. We're hiding behind three people that are saying it. Everybody, let's say it together. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. And the next five. Vav, Zain, Chet, Tet, Yud. Okay. The next, you already know because you know English. Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, equivalent is equivalent to the KLMN. KLMN. You can say it in English, you can say it in Hebrew. Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun is equivalent to the KL. I'm sorry. Um, Yud, Kaf, Lamed, yeah. KLMN, right? So we can say Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun. You notice that Kaf and Chaf is the same. Without the dot, it's a chaf, sound again similar to the chet, and with the dot inside is kaf, means in here the word pictures, the palm of the hand. So, kaf, lamed, mem, nun, just like the kelemen, right? Let's say it together, kaf, lamed, mem, nun. And from the top, aleph, bet, gimel, dalet, hey, vav, zain, chet, tet, yud, God's name, right? Kelemen. Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, one to remember, Samech, Samech, one to remember, Samech, followed by Ain, which means an eye, and followed by Pe, which means a mouth, right? So we have Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zain, Chet, Tet, Yud, then Kelemen, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samech, want to remember, then Ein, Pei. When you get to the Pei, you're already at the righteous man. Tzadik. Tzadik is also means a righteous man in Hebrew. So Tzadik, righteous man, and you're done because the rest of them are again the same in English. Q-R-S-T. Are you familiar with those letters? You are. So Kufrei Shin Taf are identical to Q-R-S-T. Same order, right? But different names, we say Kuf, Resh, Shin, and Taf. <clears throat> you notice there is a Shin and there is a Sin. When the dot is on the left-hand side, the letter is Sin. And when the dot is on the right-hand side, the letter is Shin. It will be like the S-H in English. Followed by the last letter, the Taf, the T, the equivalent of T. And then five letters. Should they appear at the end of the word, they will have something we call the Sofit, the final form. So if should one of the letters, the kaf, the mem, the nun, the pei, and the tzaddik, and that's on page three, <clears throat> if they appear at the end of a word, they will receive the sign which will be slightly different than the letter. Well, some of them are very different than the, le than the letter itself, but it will be the same sound except for it's in the end of the word. So if you hear the word, let's say, maim, Maim, you hear the ma, 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 mem, right? You hear it twice. You hear it in the beginning of the word, you hear it at the end of the word, right? Maim. So you know, should one of those letters, kaf, mem, nun, pe, or tzadik, tzadik is the T, Z together in English, tz, tz sounding. So should one of those letters appear at the end of a word, you write it with the final letter, final letter, right? It's right there on page three. And <clears throat> if it's not, you write the regular letter. So the word maim, for instance, water, the word maim is spelled with a regular mem in the beginning. What makes the sound of yi, ya, yo, 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 it's the letter yud, just like it is as you see it here. So you probably write it with mem, yud, and then a final mem. Mime is an amazing word, it's an it's amazing substance, it's the most amazing substance in the universe. This is, of course, you know, chemistry will tell you that it's the only substance in nature that we know that in its uh, a solid state is lighter than it's in liquid state or gas state. The water, when they freeze, ice is lighter than water. It's the part of the anomaly of the water, right? It starts right there in Genesis 1, the anomaly of that word starting right there in Genesis 1. It says in the very first verse, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim 
ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Bereshit ve'alayim ta shamayim. Shamayim. Okay, shamayim is heaven, but it includes the word mime. You can hear it. Later on, it gives us some more detail to the job of God, how really the earth is formed. And it says there, Vayavdel Elohim bein hamayim asher, he creates the firmament, the rakia, and he separates between the water below the firmament and the water above the firmament. So we have water above and water below. Now look, the mere word of heaven includes the word water, which substantiate the biblical narrative of shamayim. The word shamayim includes already the word maim. You can hear it. And some people say sham maim. Sham is there. There is water. Sham maim. There is water. Whether we want to believe it or not, it's a matter of faith. If we accept the Bible, we believe what's in the Bible. If we want to play scientific, pop, 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 then you can say, now, now, we know better now that it's not. You see, this whole thing with scientific um, gets to the point that every, about every 10 to 20 years, another th a physical theory kind of prevails, throws away the prevalent theory that was, you know, valid until that year, and a new one comes and, and conquers the world. Right now, Stephen Hawking, you know, the big bang is the big one. All right, that's what happened. But you know what? Look at physics. Look at physics. Just uh, Albert Einstein with his relativity theory, nothing can disprove that yet. Very few people understand it anyway. I'm among those who doesn't und does not understand it. But the theory that was really prevalent for many years here was the theory of the so-called the quantum theory. The quantum in physics, basically what it says, besides getting too scientific, which I am not, it speaks about the ability of a particle, of a mass, to be here and here at the same time. You can just be here and here at the same time. How does it happen? You shoot it from, a, you know, from those particle accelerators, and you can show it mathematically. They knew it happens, and they can do it. So what? So that means that the Earth does not, was not created in the way God explained it. Where is the contradiction here? Then the new theory came out, threw away almost everything of the old theory, and this is the chaos theory. The chaos theory, in the, uh, which is prevalent, it's still prevalent today, <laughs> they're coming up with new stuff, and the chaos theory says everything is, of course, planned, and it has order and systematic, and everything is related, except for we don't understand how, and they came up with a nice story of the butterfly effect, according to which a butterfly that was kind of move its wings in China, in Shanghai, China, can actually cause a thunderstorm in New York City. This is the theory of, of the... So, again, what, that's very nice, that's very sweet. I met a, a group of doctors. I respect doctors very much, except for I met some of them that are they're, that, you know, very young, they're 30-something, each one of them is a professional, one is a heart surgeon, the other one is a lung surgeon, the other one is this. My friend, one of them lives here in San Francisco. And we met with those 15 of them, each one of them is a top, you know that. And I, I respect doctors very much. Listen, you know, I need them once in a while. So I, I asked them at the table there, so you take yourself as like serious scientists, and they, in a serious modesty, say, well, you know, you know. So you do, right? You do, right? Well, you know, I guess too. So what, what do you think of doctors and medical practices about 50 years ago? You learned a lot about it, right? And they put this and, you know, oh, wow, they kind of gave a smile and said, there was a lot of stuff they did not know then. So what do you really think of that medicine? Well, what, well it was like in its baby stages, of course. But that's very good. And what do you think about the scientists, doctors, about 100 years ago? So everybody's laughing at the table. They say, wow, that was almost witchcraft, right? Is that witch doctors. I said, this is wonderful. So what do you think a doctor from 100 years from now is going to think about you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> so we know everything. <laughs> so everything in a, in a big, I call it, we need to take those kind of all new theories with respect, but with a nice rock of salt, right? Not grain, rock. Vowels in Hebrew is something very simple. They can be found here on page 
on page, well, on page nine, again, I saw there are two, bet and vet, kaf and chaf, pay and fe, and shin and sin. The difference between those, page nine, is where you put the dot. I, again, I have to apologize because I'm rushing up. I, I normally spend much more time if I do need, I need the two extra hours when it's a real seminar. We make it really part of your DNA. You live here and your ears are popping out Hebrew letters, you know. But I can't do it in this, in this form, you know, so we, can, we need to rush in so I can do everything I plan to do today. We go to page 12. Page 12 really put in a schematic way the entire sound system of Hebrew, omitting some of the by sounds. Basically, there are five sounds in Hebrew. A, E, I, O, U. Right? Did I miss any? That's it, right? <clears throat> the A, the sound A, is written by making a little T underneath the letter. That gives the sound of A to the letter. So when we write in Hebrew, do you write, Jeff? No. You don't. Okay, that's good. I'm, I'm glad that some people can say, I don't. So when you write something, I'm going to pick on him again. I, you know. <laughs> I promised to pick on somebody else. Oh, of course, Rocio, where are you? Oh, right here. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> we start from the letter and we go to the vowel. So the vowel, the little T underneath the letter sounds like A in Hebrew. That's the sound, A. So if I put, let's say, an M, something equivalent to the M, called the Mem, and I put A underneath the Mem. Remember, we start from the Mem, the M sound, and we put an A. What do you hear? You're right, you hear Ma. Who else has taken Hebrew ever before? Nothing, any Hebrew before. Somebody close by. Wonderful. What's your name, sir? Greg. Oh, you're Greg from the last time. You're supposed to sit next to him. You confuse me. <laughs> okay. Craig, right? So you don't know anything about Hebrew. If I give you the letter, the letter is, let's say, not a mem, but the letter is a bet. Bet, bet has, the care, has the ability to be ba or b or bo or bu or be. Depends what vowels you associate to that. So if I give you the vowel, be, the letter bet, and I put underneath that the little t, which is the a, what do you hear? Ba. ba. He's right. So we put together the letter, and we read from the letter to the vowel. This is how we connect between them. Staying with Craig again. Same letter, bet, that you have. But let's say I put a, I put a vowel, which is, in Hebrew, it's a little dot that we put underneath. That one sounds e. So if you put it under any letter, it gives it the sound E. So you have the bet with an E. What do you hear? B. B. That's right. Jeff, if the same letter that you did, let, what letter did you do? Bet? Mem. If you take the mem and I put a lot, little dot underneath that, the E, what do you hear? Me. He hears me. That's good. That's the whole process. This is the whole thing. So look at, the, at page 12. <clears throat> you have A. And Hebrew is read from right to left. Not left to right, right to left. You have the A. And next to it, another A. Then you have the three dots underneath that. That's an A. Rocio, do you, you, know, you read Hebrew, Rocio? You don't. Wonderful. So now let's pick on you. So if the letter, I'm giving you another one, not Jeff's and not Craig's. I'm giving you another letter. Let's say the letter is Dalit. It's the equivalent of the D in English. Dalit. And I put an A underneath the Dalit. What do you read? The letter Dalit is like the D, and I put an A underneath. What do you get? What do you get? D. D. If I put the D with an A, it makes it D. If I put the Sheen with an O, what do you get? All of us. What? Show. If I put the Sheen with an E, what do you get? She. If I put a Mem with an U, what do you get? Mu. Okay, like a cow. Right. Exactly. Just like a Mu. Yes? Mem and U makes it Mu. And then we have an O and another O. And then we have an O and another O. And then we have a silent one. And then we have an A. Two dots, just the A followed by a Yud makes it A. Not a different vowel, it's the same thing. So people say, well, you know, oh, fine, but why do you need this too? I mean, this is an A, A, and this is an A. So wasn't it enough to have just one A? And then you have an A and another A. Well, to put three and that's it. Why do we have to remember this A and this A? So I tell them about a gentleman who lived in New York City and he was a stockbroker in uh, the Wall Street. And one day he decided, this is it from Wall Street and financial stuff. I'm going to go and I'm going to be a farmer. Yeah, farmer. 
So he takes off and he ends up in some farm, let's say in Washington. So he walks by, you know, kind of checks the area, and he sees soon enough a sign that says cows for sale. <clears throat> and indeed, he sees two cows there. One white cow and another one black cow, right there. And he's very excited. His mind is thinking, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to buy these cows for sale. And this is my new fate. Who needs Wall Street? And he asked the farmer, excuse me, are the cows healthy? And the farmer says to him, oh, the white one, very, very healthy. And he said, what about the black one? So, oh, black one, too, very healthy. I said, huh, that's kind of weird, but okay. So he asked him, can I expect a lot of milk from those cows? And the farmer says, well, from the black one, a lot, lots of milk. And so, what about the white one? And he said, for the white one, tons of milk, lots of milk, too, lots of milk. I said, this is weird. I mean, it's cows for sale. Well, and he asked him, tell me about fertility. I mean, you know, I mean, you just can't keep a cow forever. I mean, you need the are the yeah, they're female. Well, can, what about fertility? Can I expect little, you know, those baby, what do you call them, cubs? <laughs> and the, are they, are they fertile, fertile? And the farmer says, you kidding me? I mean, the black one is very fertile. And said, oh, this is wonderful. What about the white one? He said, the white one, you're kidding? The white one looks at the male and she's pregnant. <laughs> and he said, this is, uh, he said, you know, I don't understand what you're doing here. I'm asking you about the cows. You always answer me about what cow? The white one, why do you do that? And the farmer says, this is very simple. The reason that I do that is because the white one is for sale. And he looks back at the signs and says, what do you mean the white one is for sale? What about the black one? So, oh, the black one too. <laughs> so, this is an A, ah, the other one too. This is an A, eh, the other one too. This is an O, oh, the other one too. This is an O, the other one too. Why? Don't know. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> No, I guess I do know. I mean, it's a, the reason for that is grammatical, is to leave room for spelling and, and properly voweling letters. So this is basically the reason for that. Now we go back to, we go forward to page 13, and <clears throat> I already spoke about page 13. This is how to read. We put together a letter and connect it to a vowel. Together, we start from the letter, then to the vowel. We're not going to spend all this time on this page, but that's basically what you do. And that leads us to page 14. And basically, you, what we just did now, you see there. And the English underneath on page 14. Bet with an A makes it ba. Bet with another A, this is the white cow, it's also an A. <clears throat> and bet with an A makes it be. And bet with an A makes it also a. Biblically, there's a slight difference between them. There's more so be than be, but forget about that. Just make it be. It's modern Hebrew. It's the same. Biblical Hebrew, it's more so be, you know, the two letters underneath the vowel. Underneath the letter. Two vowels, the two dots underneath the letter. The one dot, though, is a B. Do you know some Hebrew? You do? Nothing at all? So if I take the letter, the letter hey which is like the age in English, and I put a dot underneath it. What do you hear? A hey with a dot. What do you hear? He, right, he. It's an age, ha, with the letter hey, with a dot underneath, that's a he. If I take a mem and put a dot, what do you hear? Me, be confident, you're right, you're me. And if it's a shin with an e, what do you hear? She. And if it's a lamed with an e, what do you hear? Lee, did you do Hebrew before? You did? You did. Okay, good. But it is a Lee, right? And that's, it's very, it's simple as can be. Now, people say, oh, well, you know, until I learn Hebrew, it sounds like Hebrew to me. I said, don't even say this word, this expression, my presence. Sounds like Hebrew to me. What are we talking about here? Chinese? What is sounds like Hebrew to me? Hebrew is simple. 22 characters. You know, you, got, you get a job, you go to some place, you go to a seminar. How long does it take you to learn the name of 22 people in your office, in your school, in your class, Jason? It, no time, you know them by name. This is Jeff, this is Craig. I mean, I learned maybe 22 names, maybe, maybe less. I didn't meet so many people, but 
it's, uh, it's not a big process to learn. Each one of them is a character. You don't treat them as Martian creatures that are fell on your head. <clears throat> you treat them as divine, spiritual, alive characters. Each one is alive, and they have been with you if the Bible and God has been with you in your heart all the time. Except for not here, but as Sue says, where is Sue? I don't know where to point. As Sue says yesterday, okay, it's in your heart, all your life. All your, back there in Ireland, before you were born, it was carried with you because you did have God in your heart. And the Hebrew was there. Hebrew is eternal. Eternal. We're looking for new truths all the time. Pastor is asking me about, well, you know, I did something after you talked to me, Pastor R. A, well, we can find a lot of refuge in the Greek because some of them don't, <clears throat> we don't, don't get everything substantiated in the Hebrew, but I'll show you the most powerful thing. I think you missed a minute before, you're not here. The most powerful teaching of the Hebrew is of the Hebrew, of the Messiah can be proven only by the Hebrew of the New Testament. It's in the New. I did not find it in the Old. It's there in the Old too, but in different manifestations. This is very powerful. I'll keep it for a little bit later. Where is my time? Where, where I'm standing? I'm, okay. All right. So, um, we are speaking about what is clear to us and what is not. What we are supposed to know, what we are not supposed to know. I know from the New Testament, Pastor Art, that when the students came to Yeshua, to Jesus, and they asked him, oh, well, so when are you coming back? And the answer was what? It's not your business to know time and that, right? It's in the Old Testament as well. The same teaching here, and this is in Deuteronomy 29, 28. Look at the, look at the word and look how English followed into the footsteps of Hebrew, the English. Hanistaro, it's not on your, in that sheet, right? It's in another one, I didn't print it out. But it's in uh, Deuteronomy 29, 28. <clears throat> it says, Until when? Okay, let's first translate it. Hanistarot, Nistar, Mister, what does it sound to you? Like what? What is Nistarot in Hebrew? What, what, what? Just not knowing the no word. Just listen to the word. Nistarot. What is it? Somebody say it. No, 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 no. What? Mystery. Mystery. Secrets. Same word as in English. Nistarot. Nistar. That's how the word mystery came to the word. Hidden. Right? Nistar. So the hidden, or the English says here, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belongs to us and to our children forever. Niglot, yeah, revealed, the obvious, the, the, the thing on the surface. And until when? Ad olam, forever and ever. This is not like, okay, only until that point happens. It says in the Bible many times, this is happening until so and so. The validity of the Torah, for instance, does not have an open-end continuum in time. It says there, until the end of days. Some rules there have a finishing point. But the jot and the tittle will stay as long as the earth is still here. Le olam, just like it says here, look, the parallel between... It's amazing. But you know what? Let's add one more step into the jot and tittle. Yeshua speaks about the jot and tittle. Everybody knows the verse, right? Not a jot and a tittle. How, what's the rest of it in, in proper English, Pastor? Will pass away from the world as long as the earth is still here, in other words, right? That's more or less. And what is the real meaning, the true deep meaning of the jot and the tittle? What is that jot and tittle? You know, when you write Hebrew, when you write Bibles, there are small beautification additions to the letters, serifs, we call them. And we add them nothing more than for beautification. This is the purpose of it. There is no other reason. But you look at mezuzah, at tefillin, you know tefillin that people put on their heads and on their hand, and at Bible books and Torah books. There is a Torah book in the congregation, well, I recommend everybody to go look at the real Torah. And you'll see those little jot and tittles over sheen and over other letters. 
they are there for beautification only. But look at that. When the rule was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, God already knew the heart of man. He already knew that there would be a King James and a new King James and the, and the third one would come out and the, and the street Bible and all of those Bibles. He knew. And he knew that things can change away from his word. And he wanted to protect the Hebrew Jason. So he said to the Moses on Mount Sinai, and this is a tradition that is carried out from generation to generation, and every scribe that is being uh, authorized now to write, copy Torah, not everybody can just write the Torah. Scribes are, and they study and they swear in their lives that they are not take the authority to change a jot and a tittle from the Torah. Now, what's the full magnitude of this statement? What on earth is going to happen to the world or to the Bible if you take the letter, you know, meh or sheen, or let's go to the very smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's so small. Look at your page there. It's about a third of the size of a regular letter. The letter Yud. And it has sometimes the little jot on the top, the tittle. What happens if you omit it? Nothing. You can still read it the same way. So you took out the beautification addition of the serif to the letter. Nothing happened to the letter. God does not want even that to happen. So he says there, I give no authority, and every scribe knows that. When they write it, it goes to now computer testing or other professionals. They look at it. Hop, the jot here is not in the right angle. This is kind of neat picking. Hey, what's the big deal? Not in the right angle. Cancelled. Same thing, the right Torah. You know, they write it on a scroll. It takes a year, a year and a half to do it. It's a lot of work, but they need to cut out. They don't throw it. You don't trash it. There is a whole process of what to do. Not our subject, but they need to do it again. It needs to be done again. Even for one jot on one letter is not written properly. Neat picking, but that's how we know it from Mount Sinai. And the reason for that is very simple. Of course, you, you know what the reason is. If one person takes the liberty to change a little serif over the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, somebody else can say, now, that letter is wrong here. Let's correct the Bible and we fix it. I'll show you here. There is something that looks as though it's a mistake. As though, I say, there's no mistakes in the Bible. Your English is already chewed up for you. <laughs> no, seriously, it's chewed up because you won't see those so-called look as though there are mistakes. Your English will be nice English. In the Hebrew Bible, you will see words that look as though they contain a mistake in grammar or but they are written, and then the suggestion of the editor, of the writer, are in square brackets, telling you, I think that's the way it should be. In your English, they already took the liberty, and they corrected it for you. Well, if it's done with a good heart, then say, fine, all right? But what if it's done with a narrow mind, or with an evil mind? God forbid, that can happen too. Depends who are, you know, who's the leadership. Look. There is a verse here. It's in Genesis 49, 11. Your English will be perfect. You're never, you're never going to be able to notice anything. It says, Binding is full, right? Let's do it in simple English. Tying up to the vine tree, the, the what is it? fall, and to the soroka, the babies of, of, the, of the fall, right? The ass is called, right, to the choice vine. Basically, there is something here, it's called, this is in literary Hebrew, in literary, in literary or poetic uh, parts of the Bible, you'll see something called the parallel. You study that in school, in Bible schools. Basically, what happens, the first part of the sentence parallel the second part of the sentence. So you know, sometimes the word in Hebrew is not clear. We don't know really what it meant. We check it out in Akkadian and in Ugarit and in other languages when we don't really know. How do we understand it? Many times because of the system called the parallel. The, parallel. It, the first part of the, of the sentence parallels the second. Here is a great example and clarify the word for us that does not exist in Hebrew. It says, Osrile, the, the one who, okay, co, uh, tying up the donkey to the, to the, um, 
Okay, that's not, it's not even the important part. This is the first part. And then the second part is the important, more important. It's means he washed, laundered in wine his clothing. The second part of this sentence parallels and gives us the same thing in other words. In the blood of the vine, his garments. You see it parallel. Washed, washed. In, in wine, parallel to the blood of the vine. And then the word, levusho, kibes bayain. Kibes bayain. Levusho means his clothing. So, bedam anavim, and here comes the word in Hebrew that is looking as though it's mistaken. Suto. That's the last word in that verse. Deuteronomy 29, 28. There is no such word in Hebrew. I mean, not, not 29. It's Genesis 49, 11. There is no such word in Hebrew, suto. There isn't. Your English will say garments, right? What does it say there? Uh, your English says um, clothes, 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 right? In plural. And garments. But in Hebrew, the word is suto. There isn't such a word in Hebrew. Nowhere you can find the word suto. But we know, because of the parallel system, that it parallels for the second part of the verse, that suto rhymes or parallels to the word clothing. And there is, there is no word suto, but there is the word ksuto, with a K, with a kaf in the beginning. Ksuto means his clothing, his covering, something he covers himself. So we know, we assume that word was supposed to be ksuto and not just suto, that doesn't exist in Hebrew. We don't correct it. We put suto there, and in square brackets, we can suggest it, we think it's suto, clothing. But we don't correct it in the Bible because you'll never know what's the magnitude of something that can be perceived as though it's a mistake in the future. You don't take, and that's one. Two, you take the humility and humbleness not to take the liberty to change a letter in the Torah. This is a letter. And, of course, you cannot change even the jot and the little beautification for the letter, let alone changing a word from the Torah that what people will tend to do. I found in Leviticus some fascinating thing. When I worked with a group of pastors, they brought out something. This is the first atonement, the first Yom Kippur. <clears throat> and that was like, wow, well, that was not a mistake. It says there that should the poor bring not less than half a shekel, and the rich not more than half a shekel, right? For the atonement of the soul. This is the first tithing, kind of giving money for the organization to the group. And you know what? When it says about the rich, they took away the word not in some translation. So should give more than half a shekel. Now tell me a mistake that is just innocent from the pure-hearted writer or something that we call a value embedded departure from the word, you know? I don't want to accuse anybody, but look at your Bibles, you'll find it. I mean, a group of pastors showed it to me. Let's go further. How do we know where the truth is? How do we know? We believe deeply on that. We, 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 you believe the truth because you came here. You believe this is the truth. But many people around us and everywhere shop around for truth, shop around for Bible, shop around for church, shop around for their lives because they cannot anchor it anywhere. And some of that is the fashion of America, of quick changes, that, that, you know, a little wrinkle, you buy a new one, that a little scratch, who needs that, you know? We just change, so they, they study this, and they, you know, <laughs> we give a parallel one time in a quick story that is called the, well, that's not good, well, it's called the business of religion, the business of religion, and if I come to you right now, who, Jeff, and said, Jeff, listen to me, Jeff, don't say Jack, you're wrong last time, you know. <laughs> so I said, listen, I have a new religion for you, here is what we offer. We want our people in our new religion to be very, very versed with the world. That's for, therefore, anyone who joins our new religion is sent to anywhere he wants in the world for four months paid. 
and we also believe in comfort, so you could study our principles. You know, we give you one sheet, it's only one page. You learn our principles. We need you to be in very comfortable. So it's only top rated hotels. That's what we believe. You're going to be on only those hotels for four months, and we need your wife to be there. No wife, bring a child, bring a sister. We, can't be, we believe that you need to be with somebody. You know. Wow, you said, Daddy, I like that. Tell me more about this new religion. I like it. And I said, well, we also believe that you need to be really free of hassle and trouble and all that. So we put money in your bank every month, something around between 10 to 12,000. We don't know how much dollars, right? And he said, I love this religion. What you told me so far, this is a great religion. And I tell you, but Jeff, there is some other things that you need to do. We really don't believe in the, in the shape of your nose. I mean, this is wrong. So we believe that we need to make a little surgery on you and tie it up to your ear. So don't be like... And you say, ah, you know, I like the first part a lot, but this is like, they, you know, I said, that's not all. We also believe that you need to paint your hair in green neon that will be very glowing and in a triangle, and that's how you work. And he said, Danny, let me go. Are you married? No. So let me go home. I'll talk to my family. Let me, I, I just don't want to decide right now. I liked it in the beginning, but the second part, this, you know. So he will, probably will not want to take this religion. And this is exactly what happened there in Corinthia, in Galicia, in the Aphysia, when they received the notion of the good news, telling them, listen, people, these people are not stupid. They already knew that those idols we talked about last night are not real, Aphrodite and Cupid and all that. And they are getting the letters <laughs> coming from the land, telling them, hey, there is salvation. Don't be stupid and start believing in those solid things. There is God in the heaven, and there is salvation, and your way is paved. And say, so we like that. We liked it a lot. But they also told them, but you know what? There is Sabbath there too. So, ooh, what do you, what do you mean? We're not going to, you know, that. Ooh, don't like that part. And there is also this, and there is this, and there is kosher. And the, oh, 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 you know, I don't, no. So there's a big problem to lose everybody right there in that spot. So somewhere there, and I don't want to put a name and point and any, no, 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 but somewhere or something or some, blah, blah, along the line gave a discount on that day and say, you know what, Jeff, you don't like that part with the surgery with the nose. We like it, but you don't like it. But we want you in, Jeff. We really do want you in. So you know what? You don't need to do this thing with the nose. And Jeff comes to me and said, Danny, what about this neon hair? I mean, can we discuss that? So I said, you don't need to do that. I mean, you're fine. And he said, count me in. I'm in. He's in. So somewhere along the line, gave that discount. There in Corinthia, Aphysia, you know, in that. And that's how, really, Christianity started. The beginning of Christianity was Judaism, 50% off, only today. <laughs> <laughs> there was no way on earth that they would sell different stories to people there because they just added the salvation to a faith that existed. And that was needed to know that there is salvation and there is room to be saved. And there was no hope without salvation. And that came through. I asked Tina to remind me something about the truth, right? Do you remind me about the truth? Okay, you do. So... <laughs> so people... Sh so people shop for that truth and they just don't see it. Whereas, so they, they have the truth and they say, okay, you people, I know each one of you already know that you found a light tower in El Shaddai and in the blessed pastors and leadership here that are rich my heart in the connection to my core of Hebrew and my core of faith that I believe. And I accepted what came from other people to learning about salvation. Frank is my big assistant for that subject. He taught me about salvation. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> and uh, so shopping for the truth, you know, even in congregations like this, we, we met that. I saw another congregation. People just hop for a second to check something in uh, that place and that place, and they don't want to check and don't want to learn. Maybe there is a better truth than the Hebrew Bible. Maybe there is something better. So there was a guy here in, in let's say, in Puyallup, or, I don't know, Washington, Seattle, big enough, right? Nobody in particular. And that person said, I, I need to find the truth. 
So he says, I cannot believe that I can find it in my congregation. They teach me this Hebrew stuff, and they say that, uh, you know, we're not comp we still have to do some deeds, and it's important to be a good person. And all this. Uh, this is not exciting. This is boring. It's old. I, I need something. Oh, something on the move. You know, I saw those people in San Francisco. This was so cool. You know, there were the lights and the candles. So he goes on and said, I'm going to San Francisco. Said, Can I find the truth here? He said, yeah, what, what do we know about the truth? I mean, there's all kind of group. Go to Los Angeles, big city. I mean, they know. And he goes to L.A. and he said, I'm looking for the truth. And they tell him, well, you're coming here to L.A. to look for the truth. I mean, be serious, be real. This is the city of Hollywood. This is make-believe. You're not going to find truth here. You need to go to a serious place. He ends up in New York. He said, can I? I'm looking for the truth. I said, sir, this, I mean, you'd made all this way from Washington, and you come here to look for the truth. This is, this is Wall Street. We're all working here on fake and, and, and clock and, and, you know, and dagger. What, what truth are you looking here? And the poor guy walks, wanders all over. He can't find the truth. And he calls up and says, come back. I said, no, that, that is old stuff. I just don't think there's any valid, validity in that. Well, and then a nice person says to him, listen, you're not going to find it here in America. You go to Tibet. and said, that is right. That sounds right. I mean, I did see it. Yeah, that's it. So he ends up in Tibet, right there at the foot of the Himalaya. And, and they meet him and say, can I meet the truth? And say, well, the truth is right here. Say, yes, yeah, I knew it. I knew I just knew it. He said, can I see the truth? No, you're not ready. You need to do a lot of preparation. To oh. Well, it takes him a couple of years, and the priests are preparing him, and he does that, and then I'm Yoho Rengeki, all those kind of stuff. You know, <laughs> he does all this nice stuff there, and he's getting prepared, and he is about to meet the truth. The day comes, and this, he gets up in the morning, and three priests are saying, that's the day you are going to meet the truth. They say, yes. And they lead him very gently, right there in the foot of the Himalaya, among vegetation and big, you know, this. And he see a little shack. And he says, that's the truth. And the truth is there waiting for you. I say, wow, wow. So one priest leads him and says, just step in. And he walks right in. He opens the door. And sure enough, he sees her. She's a very big, homely looking Dark hair woman, quite homely. <laughs> it happens, you know. You know, but she sits on a big puff like this, you know, and he steps in and he bows. He doesn't know what to do, and she says to him, "Sit down, my son." I said, "Thank you." And he sits down. And he said, "You know, all my life I was, I, I was, you know, I had those Bibles, and and I knew I, I wanted to meet you." And said, I'm so glad, my son, that you're right here in my presence. Said, oh, this is wonderful. Oh, I'm so excited. And say, that's my son. Relax, my son. You found me. And he says, can you, can you just give me one advice that I can just go to the world and spread this wonderful good news? And she said, of course, my son. What I suggest to you is go there and tell nothing but the truth, only the truth and nothing but the truth. He said, whoa, this is so good. Let me, can I write it? Can I quote you? Let me write it down. This is amazing. How did you say it? Nothing with the truth and nothing. This is so good. I love that. I never heard it. He writes it down and he just keeps it. I never lose it. And the time is up and she marks to him that he needs to leave because she needs to meet other people. And he's the, the priests are waiting for him with those beautiful candles. He's in San Francisco and ha, ha, he's ready. So he's about to leave there, and he bows. He doesn't know what to do. You don't turn your, you know, that to the truth. So he goes and bows down. At the door, he says, I'm going back to the world. I want to tell about you to the people. Can I, can I talk about you? So, absolutely, my son. Go ahead, talk about me. Say, what should I tell them about you? And she looks at him and says, why don't you tell them I'm a gorgeous blonde? <laughs> <laughs> so we find the truth. <laughs> We need to go sometimes far away. No, it's right here at our foot, you know, at our lap. That I believe deeply that we don't need to go really far away. It's been there since the inception of time, and it was appointed to time that God gave it one time on the Mount Sinai to the people that He've chosen and the other people that can be grafted in and join in the kingdom. Kingdom of heaven, then, is not a place. The kingdom of heaven is accountability, accountability to the truth that I saw it so eloquently taught there by Yeshua. Let's go to another point here that is very, very I think it's a very important one. 
<clears throat> ah, we talked about some strange words, strange words in Hebrew. One of the most strangest words in Hebrew has to do with the body part. You know, all the body parts that are doublers, ears, nose, all those that we have, hands, feet, shoe, all of those, including the clothing, shoes, pants, pants is plural, all of those in Hebrew happen to me, happen to be feminine nouns. You'll say, yadaim, yafot, pretty hands, oznaim, dolot, big ear, whatever. All of them, except for one. All of, no, it's not the mouth. You mean teeth? No, teeth is plural too, and it's feminine. Shinaim, your foot. You just, you, you can't think about it. Every one of those double parts of our human body are feminine nouns, except for one. And that one is the female breasts. This is the only masculine noun in Hebrew, in plural. You think, where is it coming from? What's the reason for that? Very important reason for that. We speak about, the, this is, has to do with the manifestation of God. We tend to think of God as the Father God, right? The Father God in the Hebrew Bible have also feminine attributes. The feminine attributes of God are in the nourishing aspect of the Father. He is a nourishing God. You know the word is translated wrongly to English. We called it God of hosts. What hosts here? Who is hosting whom? It's El Shaddai. El Shaddai does mean the God, the, many, the female, man, Shaddai, Shaddai are breasts. It does have the female manifestation of the Father God. And this is the nourishing, the feeding God, El Shaddai. And you don't need to go far away from that to get the proof for that, that the nourishment of mankind coming from that word, breast, shad in Hebrew, the letter is shin, followed by the letter dalet, shad, that's breast. But if you add the name of God, the hey letter to that word, you get shin, dalet, and hey. And we say, it, you remember, shin and sin, same letter. Depends where you put the, God, the dot. And that word becomes sadeh. Shin Dalet Hey simply means a field. Field, the nourishing from the earth. So the nourishing of the mammal, the Shad, is also part of God's name. It's really not anything else than the nourishing aspect of the Almighty. He's the Father, but he's also the nourishing Father. It's also in his name. Why do I say that? Because we are getting here to, um, <clears throat> there are, we normally tend to think of, you, you do the feasts here, I understand, right? And Pastor uh, Biltz and Pastor Art are teaching the feasts here, and you also understand and you get the grasp of the feast. So besides the feast, you also, I think, you do mention the Rosh Hashanah, the Yom Kippur, the other important days that are mentioned in the Bible. I, I, I knew that. There are, how many Rosh Hashanahs do you know about? New Year. How many of them you know about? Rosh Chodesh? That's Rosh Chodesh. That's the beginning of the month. But beginning of the years, most people say there is one. Rosh Hashanah. That's it. Rosh is the head. Shana is the year. You know of two of them. There's a sacred New Year. And what are they, those Rosh Hashanahs? You're right, but what, what are they? What do they? Why do we need two Rosh Hashanahs? Do you have two Christmases and two, um, you know, two Thanksgiving or three? Um, they, it's true what you're saying. There are more. Actually, there are four. And those four are not easy to, found, to find. There is a confusion about the Hebrew month of the Bible. The confusion is this. Ask people, what, even in Israel, what's the first month? And they'll tell you, it's Tishrei, right? Tishrei, Cheshvan, it goes from Tishrei up to the months of Elul, and then Av Elul, right? Misan, Yar, Sivan, Tammuz, Av Elul, then we start the new one. And it's not true. It's not true. The Tishrei is actually, this is where we celebrate the Rosh Hashanah, but in fact, the Tishrei is the seventh month of the year, and not the first. Let me see here, the Hebrew month. Okay, the word Tishrei, coming from the Akkadian, and all of them ending the same way, to Akkadian, and it's Tasritu. Tasritu or Tasritu means the beginning. 
And this month is mentioned in the book of, in, the, in, in 1 Kings uh, 8, 2, as the month of Eitanim, the strong month, the month of Eitanim. And this is the only month that, um, and all the rest of them are in Babylonian names. Tishrei, Cheshvan, all of those are not Hebrew names. We lost the Hebrew names. We only have three months that we know the Hebrew names of that. One of them is the Eitanim, which is in Tishrei. It's found also in Ugarit, Frank, and it's, the, it's called Yerach Tashrat in, in Ugarit, in that language. The second one is Cheshvan, or called Mar Cheshvan, was called Mar Cheshvan, and it's also coming from Akkadian, and it's called Yarcho Shamano. Look at that, shaman, the shamans. Yarcho Shamano has to do something with the shamans, you know, in, that, in those kind of religions. I don't know how they get the name, but I know that in Hawaii, they have the kahuna, the big kahuna. Now, where is that coming from, the kahuna? What is kahuna? What is kahuna in Hebrew? Priesthood. Kehuna in Hebrew means priesthood, after the name Kohen. So they have this big kahuna, and how far did they go? Did, what did they make up here? They took a word from Hebrew, and it's kehuna, means the priesthood in Hebrew. The second month there is Mar Cheshvan, and um, it's called, also called Erech Shamano or Varcho Samano. Samano, Smini, eight, the eighth month. And <clears throat> the Mar is omitted. In the, in the Bible it's mentioned Mar Cheshvan in two names. Once is the eighth month. This is according, you know, the first month is the month of coming out of Egypt, basically. This is the first month. And then it's also mentioned as Yerach Bull, Bull. And I heard one of the teachings of Pastor, of Pastor uh, Biltz when he taught about King Solomon. He mentioned this verse. We're going to go back to this verse later on for uh, that powerful point that I'm trying to reach to. But I'm going a little gradually here. I don't want to jump. That's the month of Bull. It's the eighth month. And commentator thought it has to do with the vegetation and the growth of the field that is already, uh, what's the word, like crumbling in the heat? What? Sprouting. Yeah, no, the opposite of that. They're drying out. Weathering. That's the bull. Yeah, weathering. Right, right. That's good. Um, so the next one is the Kislev. Well, it's Kislimu in Akkadian. Each one of them is not Hebrew. It's Kislimu. One of them is also, we use it in Hebrew. Uh, only the three are mentioned in the Torah, but there are some of them mentioned in the, the others are mentioned in the Bible, though, but not in the Torah. In the Bible, in Zechariah, like this one, um, Kislev, the, the uh, Ksilimu, means thick, and they think it's maybe because of the thick rain is coming there. It's mentioned twice in the Torah, in the Tanakh, in the Bible, in Zechariah 7 1, and it also appears in the book of Nehemiah uh, 1 1. The next one, Tevet. Tevet is the Tabitu, that you, means in Akkadian that you're sink in it, meaning a lot of mud. That's the Tevet. Also mentioned in Zechariah uh, 1.7 this month. This is the month of Shvat. It's an important one because it relates to our subject for the second part. We're going to talk about the big point of the salvation. That month is one of those Rosh Hashanahs, the Shvat. You know, the month of Shvat. Actually, the 15th of Shvat is one of the Rosh Hashanahs, right? We're talking about four of them. Four. You know of one that we celebrate. That's the day, ten days before the Yom Kippur comes the Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. Um, but this is one that is celebrated on the 15th of Shvat, and this is called the Rosh Hashanah for the trees. That's the day that there are planting trees and, you, you know, they send it to Israel. I, I think even your congregation did something with that. The next one is the Akkadian name, Adaru. Adaru, people don't know what the meaning of that name is. Uh, they think it is the beginning, the month of the harvesting. Or it means dark, so I think maybe it's still cloudy. It's appearing only one time in the Bible. No, a few times in, um, in the book of Esther, the Chodesh Adar. This is where the big holiday happens. And then Nisan, and this is our important one. We need to concentrate on that one. It's in Akkadian. This is, I think, Aramaic. No, no, no. It's Akkadian. It's Nisanu, and it means Nitzanim, buds, sprouting buds. And it's appearing in the book of Nehemiah, uh, 2, 1, and in the book of es Esther, in the, yes, in Esther also, in uh, 3, 7. 
In Hebrew, it's called the month of Aviv, Aviv, which is not a name. It's not a name to be confused with the name. I heard some places they're using it as a name. It's not. It just means the month of the spring. That's all. It's not a name. The names that we have is the month of Bul. We mentioned that. Yerach Bul. And Eitanim, which is the Tishrei, which is the seventh month, which is like the Rosh Hashanah. And another one is the Yerach Ziv, which is going to be a very important part of what we do. Pastor Biltz quoted it in his teaching, uh, that verse. I'm going to quote the same verse that he taught there to show that King Solomon have wasted four years before he started building his temple. That was the mission given to him by his father David. And he quoted that verse to show, because it shows there exactly when he started building the temple. But I'm going to quote this verse in order to show something else, which is as powerful and maybe even more because it has to do with the salvation. And then we have the, okay, we, we, we can really skip those months. There is the Sivan, and it's Sivano, which is a sign, and then Tammuz, that's a Hebrew month, which is in the summer, coming after a god, a god, in not capital letter, of the Babylonians, and the in Akkadian. And that god is the Duuzo, and that's the name of the Babylonian, Tammuz, which is the, the, the god of fertility and blossom. According to the believing of the Babylonians, this God died every in the beginning of each summer and he rose again after the first rain. In the, in the, in the Bible, it's mentioned one time in Ezekiel 8, 14, and it says, and here, and there are the women sitting and mourning over the Tammuz. That Tammuz is the god of the Babylonians. To finish up, to wrap here, I want to say this. There was a problem with the Rosh Hashanah, how to assign the days, and I'm not getting too complicated with that. I know this is a subject of Pastor Bills. I'm really not getting there, but there was a very, very interesting point. In the year 359, just like 15, what, 1,500 years ago or so, 16, Hillel ben Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, he set up the rules the rules of the Hebrew calendar that are still prevalent up until today. It was kind of a comp complex uh, way to be done, but it's set in this way, that there will be seven leap years in every cycle of 19 years. Does it make sense to you? No. Uh, uh, yeah, it does. Okay, be every, there will be seven leap years in every cycle of 19 years. Adding that to the formula caused the situation that Rosh Hashanah, will never, ever fall on Sunday, Wednesday, or Friday. Now, go ahead, ask me why Rosh Hashanah cannot fall on Sunday, Wednesday, or Friday ever. Ask me why. I don't know why. That's another thing you're going to ask Pastor Bills. I, I honestly don't know why. Really, I don't. Ask Pastor Bills on that, that one. So, uh, but it's, I want to lead. I want to lead later on because we come there because there will be a very important point that has to do with the appointed times. And it has to do with the second moment that was crucial in the history of the world. We talk about the one before, about Balaam about to curse the nation of Israel, and God switches his heart, and instead of emanating the curse, he emits the greatest blessing. And the second moment that was crucial to the history of the world and to the, to the events to fold, happened at the crucifix. At the moment of crucifixion, something very dramatic happened that you cannot imagine unless you see that Hebrew, but we're going to take a break before that, so I'll make sure that nobody escapes until we come back. <laughs> Thank you.